We have covered linear regression using basis functions, and we showed how to fit these uh, functions to the data. For example, we could do fitting via maximum likelihood optimization, where we obtain the optimal parameters either in closed form, so in one step, or obtain it via an iterative gradient descent approach. And we saw that we can actually fit quite complex functions to the data using these basis functions. But now there's choices to be made, there's hyperparameters to be set. So what kind of basis functions am I going to use? How many of them? And some choices lead to more reliable models than others. So uh, these choices have consequences. And in this video, we're going to talk a bit about one of the most important consequences to spot. We're going to talk about overfitting and underfitting. Now consider again this fitting problem where we want to reconstruct this, this green uh, line over here. So it describes some real world phenomenon. Uh, it's in this green, so it's some sine wave a mapping from X to some target T uh, described by this sign. And what we have are the blue measurements. And now we want to reconstruct uh, what kind of model uh, generated this uh, these data points, right? So we have a true model which we want to reconstruct and there was some absolute noise that led to these uh, noisy blue uh, measurements. And now we're going to do this with uh, polynomial basis functions. Uh, so that's the choice that we make, but then still we have a choice of, okay, what order of basis functions we are going to use. We already saw this example before. So in um, the MS0 case, I'm only fitting the, this bias term. So that gives me very poor, uh, a poor model. Um, we go to higher order, we have this linear slope. We go to MS3, so up to uh, cubed powers of X, we are able to actually do a quite good job. And if we go all the way to MS9, we actually have a very noisy fit. It's a perfect fit because it goes precisely to the data points, but this fit doesn't generalize well. Now these effects uh, we call underfitting and overfitting respectively. So on the top left, we have underfitting, meaning that my model is too rigid. It's, it's not flexible enough to really represent the data. So um, what I get is a pretty stable result. So I always uh, approximate a line. So my models always look somewhat the same, uh, but that's it. I don't have very much predictive or expressive power. And what you see at the bottom right is called overfitting. So we're fitting to the data. So we're doing a good job, we're do but basically we're doing a too good job. We're really fitting to the data or to the noise in, in this case. So we get a model that sort of follows the data roughly, but there's a lot of noise to it. And we call this overfitting. So basically my model has too much expressive, expressive power that it can now also spend its expressive power also to fitting to these noise components. Now let's see if we can actually spot this, right? Because now we know um, our, our true signal is this sine wave, um, but of course, in practice, we don't, do not know what the ground truth is. We only have these blue measurements, uh, but still we want to make sure that we're not overfitting. We actually want this thing. It generalizes well to new data points, but suppose I don't have these new data points and I want to get a feeling of whether or not I'm overfitting. Um, so we, what we can do, we can actually look at the weights that are obtained um, to obtain these functions. So that's shown over here. So we have these four different models. So in MS0, I'm only going to fit this bias uh, term to it. MS1, I also have this linear uh, slope. So I have all these coefficients and these are the weights uh, that define my model. So let's take a look at MS6. It consists of a bias, a linear, a quadratic and a cubic term. So with these weights, so with these weights, I can construct a function that looks like this. And now when I go to MS9, this overfitting case, I see that these uh, values, they really take on extreme values. So they become very large. Now this is a clear sign of overfitting. Now I'm going to write this down. So uh, this is a clear sign of overfitting. And in a way it's a bit surprising, but in another way, in another way not. And what I mean with that is that I have this model MS6, which really, uh, so this set of parameters could also be, have been obtained with this MS9 case. And with this, I mean um, the, the set of basis functions up to order six uh, spans a subspace, a subspace 
of the MS9 case. So I could also represent I could also represent this function with MS9 uh, uh, basis functions, but this is not going to happen. And why is this not going to happen? Because we told the machine learning algorithm to minimize uh, the sum of squared errors. So really, we want to go precisely to these data points. And in that sense, this model is not good enough because it still makes errors. And in order to go precisely to these data points, I have to really uh, crank up the, these weights such that I have sort of momentum going straight through it and up and down. So I have to tune these weights to, to very extreme values to really precisely minimize my, my error function. But actually the best way to, to spot over and underfitting is to really test it on, on real data. So I train my model on training data. And if I want to have a good estimate of how well my model generalizes to unseen data, I, I will just test it on, uh, on test data, on data that the model hasn't seen before, that wasn't used for training, just to get an impression of how well uh, it performs in new, new settings. So that's what we did over here. So we have these models for different orders of the basis functions. So zero is only fitting a bias and nine is fitting a polynomial of order nine to the data. Okay, so what we see then focusing on the training data set. So that's the thing that we're actually minimizing in our optimization uh, framework. We see that uh, for the MS0 case, I'm only fitting a bias and we make quite a lot of errors. And if we then increase the flexibility of a model, so going to higher orders, we see this training error decreases, right? So I'm better able to fit uh, to the data. And it decreases in this region only a little bit, slightly, slightly, but then we go to the MS9 case, uh, then my model is flexible enough to really fit precisely to the data and my error drops completely to zero. Now, if we were to have an independent test set, so this wasn't part of the training uh, procedure, I could test how well this model performs in this set. And as to be expected, this, this test error is higher than my train error, right? Because I haven't seen this data before, so okay, it makes sense that, that I'm not as good on, on the real test data that I haven't seen before. So, but we see a similar trend. So if we increase the model complexity, we see my training error decreases, but also my test error uh, decreases. So this means I'm able to use this model in practice. And then we come to a region where we see that it doesn't matter too much which precise uh, order of the basis function I use. So I have a, a good uh, a low test uh, train error, but also a good test error. And then I increase model complexity to the point where, we, where I start to do overfitting. And then I see my test error uh, completely explodes, right? So if I were to test this really, so I have unseen test data, for example, these points in between, uh, yeah, I'm measuring a lot of error uh, so that, that is what I'm measuring with the test error, testing the performance on unseen data. Now, there's very clear patterns to this, and this is what you can recognize when you work with these two uh, uh, data sets. So on the left-hand side, we have this thing going on. So think about what we see here. We see that both the train error and the test error are quite high. So we see that this model does a poor job, both on the training and the test set. And this is a clear indication of underfitting. Now the good news is that these train and test errors are quite close to each other. So that means that the train error that I measure and report is quite representative of the true test error. So if I deploy this in practice, I can say with some confidence uh, how well the model will perform in practice. Uh, so in this case, I could say with very clear confidence, with strong confidence that it's going to be doing a terrible job. So at least I can say something about it. Uh, and then we increase the model complexity and then I enter this region and this is beautiful. This is what you want to see. We want to see that the train and the test error is close to each other. So um, the, the, the training error that I measure here is sort of representative of my true test error. And I see that uh, the error is low. So this is a good model. So it's a good model for both on the train and the test set. Then on the right hand side of this plot, something interesting starts to happen again. Now the train error and the test error start to deviate from one another. And this is really important sign that you should watch out for. So this gap that you see over here is called the generalization gap. So it's the gap between the train and test error. And obviously we want this generalization gap to be as close, uh, as small as possible, because then it means that my training error is representative of my test error. And we know that my model is going to generalize uh, quite well. 
Uh, but if it starts to deviate from one another, uh, then I cannot make such statements anymore. And actually this is a super clear sign that we're doing overfitting. Okay, so we see that increasing model complexity by going to a higher order of these basis functions is beneficial for, for my training data, uh, also for the test data, but at some point, really, I start overfitting and this is a very bad thing. So it doesn't generalize well to new data. Now, one solution to overfitting, and there's actually many solutions to overfitting, but one solution, very straightforward forward solution is to just gather more data. And this is, of course, easily said. Uh, in practice, it's maybe some, sometimes hard to, to collect your data. Uh, but in general, in machine learning, you really want as much data as possible. And in this case of overfitting, we see that if we already increase the number of data points to 15, and we're still considering the MS9 uh, polynomial fit case, I actually start to do a better job. And if I go to the NS100 case, I get this actually very uh, beautiful fit. And of course, the reason that I now no longer see this overfitting is because now my model has to make compromises. It cannot just fit through each of these data points anymore because it will make errors anyway. There's too many data points to take into account. So you have to make compromises and that pushes this model to actually come up with a, a reasonable uh, predictive model. Okay, so having more data is a solution to this problem. Uh, but as said, uh, collecting data can be challenging. So what if you do not have all this data available and I still want to prevent overfitting, what should I do? And this is something that we, uh, that we will discuss in the next video.